All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. This is uh, the second uh, uh, presentation of uh, this uh, fourth, I guess, a cycle of uh, webinars in uh, phenomenology of bioethics. Today, I have uh, the big pleasure of uh, introducing to you uh, Ingrid Vendrel Ferran. She's going to present of the feeling of vitality, and uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susie, for inviting me. I am very happy to be in your series. <laughs> and um, yeah, I prepared some PowerPoint so I can just share with you my... my can you see something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, let me try if this moves. Yeah. So I'm going today to speak about a special kind of feelings. These are these feelings of vitality. So this is the structure of my talk. So first I will present the topic of research and I will show why I think that this uh, topic is very relevant for bioethics. Then I will try to conceptualize feelings of vitality and I will do so in section two and three. First, I will try to show how not to understand feelings of vitality, so the, the ways that we should avoid to, con to, to go to conceptualize these feelings. And then I will present my proposal according to which feelings of vitality are a sui generis category. Then in section four, I will uh, make something which is a bit speculative, but uh, which I found it very interesting and where I am happy to hear about your feedback and is to present some varieties of feelings of vitality. And then in the conclusion, I will present some uh, results of this research. So I start with the topic of research. So feelings of vitality encompass a broad range of experiences in which we feel the powers of life, its increments and decrements, its ups and downs. So feelings of vitality are um, the kind of experience that we have when we feel, for instance, energetic, or when we feel dispirited, when we feel vigorous or full of life or exhausted. So this is a kind of um, affective phenomenon in which we feel increments or diminutions of our life power, so to say. I think that these kind of feelings are very important for bioethics because um, so um, there are, um, they contribute to our understand better central concepts of bioethics such as fatigue, pain, illness, or recovery, and because they can help us to understand some important elements of the bioethical practice, for instance, uh, empathy. So here I put two examples in extreme fatigue, in bodily pain, in illness, or at the end of life, we can feel how life fades away from us and in excitement or in feeling renew, we feel life pulsing through us. And um, I think that it's also very important that we are able to empathize and feel with others feelings of vitality. So we can perceive that the other person is tired or that the other person is uh, full of uh, energy. And I think that we are able to do so not only with human beings, but also with animals and even with plants. So with everything what is alive, we are able to empathize or feel with this kind of um, powers of life, so to say. So I move now to the section two, and this is, uh, that is how not to understand feelings of vitality. So we have um, today some categories to understand our affective life. So we speak about affective phenomena very often in terms of emotions, such as um, fear, or uh, envy. We speak about our, our affectivity also in, in terms of moods, such as being cheerful or being depressed. And then there is these other two categories of feelings. This is these background feelings and these existential feelings. We will see now what uh, these feelings are. And um, so this is the, these four possibilities are four possibilities that we have to conceptualize these feelings of vitality but I think that they are uh, not good. So I think that we should avoid to conceptualize 
feelings of vitality in terms of emotions, moods, background feelings, or existential feelings. So I think, and I will demonstrate now, that it's not a good idea to say that this feeling energetic or feeling full of life is an emotion, a mood, a background feeling, or an existential feeling. I start with the first category that's uh, emotions. And my thesis is, as it's clear in the title, feelings of vitality are not emotions. And you will ask me, why are not emotions? Well, I think that we have two important, um, two important arguments against the view that feelings of vitality, vitality are emotions. And the, they are uh, derived from the, from the fact that both emotions and feelings of vitality exhibit different intentional patterns. So we know that emotions have material objects, and with the term object, I refer to items, animals, persons, situations, events, and so on. For instance, fear, which is a case of an emotion, can be directed towards a person, my neighbor, an animal, a lion, a thing, for instance, an indeterminate object appearing on my balcony, or a situation flying. All these different objects um, are what uh, is called today material objects of the emotions. Feelings of vitality do not have the same kind of objects like emotions. So unlike emotions, feelings of vitality do not target material objects. They are forms of self-experiencing. They are not feelings about our self in the sense that, for instance, pride can target ourselves. But this feeling energetic or feeling tired are experience in which uh, we um, feel ourselves. So we experience ourselves through them. I put that in this way because I think that it's uh, the best way to catch that. So they do not have material objects. And then, um, so this is the second difference between emotions and feelings of vitality. A vitality emotions have formal objects. That's a term introduced by Kenny and uh, which is uh, widely used in contemporary research. For instance, we can find it in the Sousa. The formal object refers to the evaluative or axiological dimension in which the material objects are presented in the emotional experience. In the case of fear, my fear can target um, an object, a person, an animal, but the point is that in all these cases, the object appears to me as being dangerous. And this dangerous is the formal object of the emotion. By contrast, these feelings of vitality are not responses to this formal object by ways of apprehending the evaluative dimension of an experience I'm going through. For instance, in feeling tired, I, is feeling tired is a way to apprehend a diminution of my vital energy, and it's not a response to a diminution of my vital energy. So it's a way in which I grasp an evaluative dimension, but of my, myself, and not a response to an evaluative um, property. So it seems that feelings of vitality cannot be conceptualized in terms of emotions, but since emotions very often appear together with feelings of vitality, then uh, we tend to, um, to overlook these feelings of vitality. For instance, in shame, we can feel uh, that we lose uh, vigor. So this is the, a case in which we have an emotion related, um, a related feeling of vitality, but uh, I think that both uh, should be separated uh, when we conceptualize them. So the next option is moods. And my thesis is also, we should avoid to conceptualize feelings of vitality as moods. So my question, can feelings of vitality be understood as moods? So Thomas Fuchs, I think that he will be there next week, isn't it? So, okay. So he has considered feelings of vitality as a category close to moods and feelings of attunement. So he does not say that feelings of vitality are moods, but that they are very, very close. In his view, vitality is a bodily background feeling, which he refers to as befinden. He used the Heidegger term for that. This is the well-being or ill-being of a person, and sees as closely related to moods such as serenity, euphoria, dysphoria, and so on. 
So there are some commonalities between moods and feelings of vitality. So in both cases, we have forms of bodily involvement that cannot be localized at a specific part of our body. So it's that we are involved bodily in as a whole. So uh, neither moods nor feelings of vitality target a specific objects. That's also another commonality. And both have the capacity to color our engagement with the world and to affect our mind globally. So when we uh, wake up tired, there's a case of feeling of vitality, or when we wake up depressed, there's a case of a mood. These are affective states that color our relations with our environment. Both have this commonality. So in both cases, when I am tired or when I'm depressed, this is going to influence the way in which I relate to others, in which I open the door of the flat, in which I say hello to the neighbor, everything. So this, there are strong commonalities between moods and feelings of vitality. However, I also think that at the level of the intentional structure, we um, can establish clear distinctions between moods on the one side and feelings of vitality on the other side. The first distinction is this one, does moods have a kind of global intentionality? It is said that they target everything we encounter while being in a mood, so they, are, um, they target the world. And in contrast, these feelings of vitality are primarily ways of experiencing ourselves, our immediate environment, and the lived bodies of others. And so they can affect our mind. This is not uh, their primary function to present us the, world's, uh, the world globally. Second difference between both is that moods prompt us to experience certain evaluative properties of the environment. For instance, if I am depressed, it is more likely that I will experience the negative evaluative properties of the dangerous, the menacing, the fearful, that I am more um, sensitive for some possibilities in my environment. And in contrast, the feelings of vitality are not primarily linked to what is possible or more likely to be experienced, but to what is really there or is going to happen immediately. So in feeling fatigue, I apprehend the decrement of energy as really present and not as a mere possibility. So this, it can happen that um, afterwards, so my feeling of fatigue present me the world also as a place in which um, it's more, more probable that uh, bad things happen to me, but uh, the immediate function is to present what is going on or what is um, almost happening in this uh, moment. In, in my life and my surroundings. And um, finally, moods present the world to us as a horizon in which evaluative properties of many different kinds are more likely to be experienced. For instance, depression shapes the way in which the world is presented as dangerous, menacing. And by contrast, the evaluative properties sensed in the feelings of vitality are related to the increments and decrements of life and this is something that in the early phenomenological tradition, for instance, it's called vital values. So these are values about um, life uh, going in increment or in diminution. So these three differences relate to where each one of these affective states is primarily focused, but they are significant enough to say that feelings of vitality are not moods. So I move now to the next category, and this is the background feelings. So can this kind of feelings of vitality be conceptualized as background feelings? If we take a look to Damasio's book on background feelings, he describes these feelings in the following terms. They originate in background bodily states and not in emotions. They are a minimalist in tone in beat, the feeling of life itself, the sense of being can be either pleasant or unpleasant and are neither excessively positive nor excessively negative. They are subtly aware of this feeling. We are subtly aware of these feelings and we can report on their quality. And um, then they, are, they say this kind of feelings, the background feelings are about body state. 
His examples are here very instructive because if we uh, look at them, they are, they, he speaks about fatigue, energy, excitement, wellness, sickness, tension, relaxation, and so on. So uh, we can have the impression that he's talking about uh, these uh, feelings of vitality that I have in mind. However, I think um, that we should avoid to um, conceptualize feelings of vitality, uh, vitality in terms of background feelings. Because for Damasio, these background feelings are feelings um, that refer to uh, changes happening in the body. These are feelings of inner bodily states or feelings of what is happening in the organism. And this is quite physiological in the way in which he conceptualized that. And I think that the feelings of vitality that I have in mind, even if, I, um, if we both speak about fatigue and feeling energetic, I think that um, I refer to a kind of experience of the libid body. Not, not, we cannot just conceptualize them in such organic terms of, as Damasio is, dying, is doing, because I think that uh, the central point of these um, feelings of vitality is that is an experience of our not of our organic body, but about how we sense our body. So not uh, about uh, organic changes happening there. So there is in phenomenology, this, this distinction between the physical body. And I think that the Masio is uh, speaking about the physical body. That's what we can measure and what we can touch. And then the libid body. And the libid body is how we sense our body, how we experience our body. And this cannot be measured. And that's what I want to put my focus here in speaking about feelings of vitality. So I move now to the last category where uh, that I think we should avoid um, in our conceptualization of, uh, of feelings of vitality. And this is this category of existential feelings. This is a concept uh, that has been introduced by Matthew Radcliffe. Um, that's a long time ago, but he has become very famous with this concept. I don't know if you are familiar with, but um, existential feelings, that's a concept that he develops uh, coming from Heidegger very strongly, are for him a form of affective experience. They are bodily felt, although we must not be always aware of them. They shape the space of possibilities. They pre-structure the background of all experience and ground our sense of belonging to the world. And these feelings underlie our existence and constitute the context in which a specific intentional attitudes become possible. Again, we can take a look here to his examples of feelings of vitality. He um, says that feeling alive, dead, distance, detached, dislodged, estranged, isolated, and so on, overwhelmed, suffocated, cut off, lost, disconnected. These are his examples of existential feelings. So we could think here that maybe our feelings of vitality fit into this category. And it's very interesting, interesting uh, that, uh, that if we look at the literature on the issue, we, should, we see two authors, Jan Slavi and Achim Stefan, who have argued that um, there is a type of existential feelings which encompass feelings of vitality. In their view, this, there is this class that has pure intentional feelings, existential feelings, sorry, reflect one's basic bodily function, and then they put examples feeling alive, fresh, tired, or feeling that one has or is a body. This might be taken indeed as a suggestion to understand feelings of vitality as a subclass of existential feelings. However, I want to resist this uh, option because unlike existential feelings, feelings of vitality have a sui generis intentional structure in feeling ourselves, our lived body and its immediacies are given to us. And this, is, this does not really fit to the definition of um, existential feelings. And then I think that the fine-grained nature of feelings of vitality consists in apprehending an evaluative dimension of our bodily reality, and that is our, the decrement or increment of the life powers. So I think that 
We are quite lost if we try to understand feelings of vitality as emotions, moods, background feelings, or existential feelings. So we should avoid to do so. And we have to take things as they are. And it is that feelings of vitality seem to be a sui generis class of feelings. So this is um, my main thesis for now. So they, they are a sui generis class. Now we want to understand better how they are. So it's not enough to say they are a class by their own. We cannot subsume them under other categories. So in my um, attempt to understand feelings of vitality better, I think that is very, very useful and very um, interesting to go back to classical phenomenology. And I propose now to go back to Shela's proposal if we take a look in one of his um, books, in his formalism in ethics and non-formal ethics of values, he develops a very interesting model of affectivity, according to which affectivity can be classified in four different categories. The first one is the sense feelings. These are sensations of pleasure and pain. This uh, sense feelings uh, can be localized in a specific parts of the body. So if you have pain, you can say, I have pain in my uh, head or in my belly, whatever. And they point to what is pleasant or painful. The second category is very interesting for us because of that, so I put that in red, is that feelings, um, uh, there are vit vital feelings, such as feeling tired, ill, or alive, and these are related to vital values. And these vital values for him are the novel and the mean. This is a bit strange for us that these are the paradigmatic cases of vital values, but Sheila uh, was at this point very strongly influenced by Nietzsche. And he takes this novel and mean as uh, paradigmatic cases of vital values. And then there are psychological feelings that are classical cases of emotions. And then um, there are spiritual feelings or feelings of the personality. We could say today, these are probably also emotions, bliss or desperation. And these are related to the highest values that are for him a spiritual values of sacred and profane. He takes also this idea from Rudolf Otto who uh, wrote a book at that time about uh, the sacred. So I think that we should look at this second category that Sheila develops in his book, these vital feelings, because this can be very helpful for us to conceptualize feelings of vitality. So he says they are feelings of the libid body, which he describes as a kind of consciousness of our own body. And that is what you experience of your own body without the help of your hands. So that is which kind of um, sensing you have now of your own body. This kind of consciousness does not disappear even if we try to think away the external perception of the body. So if you can touch your hand and you have an external perception of the body, but that's not the kind of consciousness he's interested in. He's interested in the consciousness that you have when you, how do you feel? So how it feels your body. And uh, this is for him a unique dimension of our experience of our body, which cannot be reduced to something um, organic, to something physical. I put here some interesting quotations. I will not read them, but just that you have um, there maybe first the first sentence. So I cannot be comfortable or uncomfortable in the manner in which I am sad, blissful, or in despair. Rather, I can only feel myself. So that's the point that he's interested in. Uh, interested in. Then he said that these kind of feelings participate in the total extension of the liver body. So we cannot localize them in a part of the body. It's not like a pain in the head that, or in the belly. So you are, when you say, I feel tired, I cannot ask you, where do you feel tired? So because it's clear, it's uh, your uh, full body. And um, this is also a very intriguing thesis that he has and this, these feelings have a qualitative direction that differs from the one exhibited by the sensible feelings, by our sensations. So for instance, you can have a pain in your head, but at the same time, you can feel um, vigorous. Or uh, his example, you can feel miserable 
at the level of the vital feeling and at the same time experience, experience pleasure at the level of the sensible feelings. And here he has also two very interesting theses. I put the quotations, but uh, I, again, I will just only focus on the thesis. So these vital feelings have an intentional character. They indicate values related to life in our body as well as in the environment. It's not just the life in our body, but also in our surroundings. And then they have a function. That's also a very interesting point of his account. They can reveal dangers and advantages directly and before we intellectually understand the meaning of such dangers and advantages. So they are a form of intuition of some um, changes in the life increments and decrements in our body and uh, the environment of our body and our surroundings. So I think that we have here a wonderful way how to conceptualize feelings of vitality in this, this class that uh, Sheila calls vital feelings, vital feelings. But um, there are some, uh, so there are these interesting aspects in Sheila's proposal. There are feelings of the libid body. They are a form of consciousness of the body. They are intentional and they have a function. So he's giving us an alternative category to understand them um, if for for contemporary research. There are some issues in Scheller's account um, that I think we should uh, not take just uh, uncritically. And the first one is that he mentions these values of the novel and the mean as type typical vital values. However, it is not clear why we should take this uh, class to be more important than the category of feeling ill or feeling healthy. I think that we should not adopt this Nietzschean um, heritage in Shela here. And we should try to think that maybe our other uh, vital values, which are more paradigmatic than these values of the novel and the mean. And then um, I also uh, am very also critical uh, with this idea that Shela has that the these vital values are inferior in because for him values are given to us in a hierarchy. And these are inferior to aesthetic, epistemic, moral, and spiritual values. I think that they should be at the same level, in fact, because um, we thought feeling uh, energetic, feeling alive, feeling vigorous, we cannot have access to these other values. <laughs> so I think that uh, this um, hierarchical uh, conceptualization, we should avoid that and think that it's a separate category and different from these other values, but not inferior. The other problematic point in Shira's account is the idea of levels of feelings that are, um, yeah, that are rigidly separated from each other. So I think that it is clear that I can be uh, very um, alive and feel very energetic and at the same time suffer from uh, a pain in, uh, in a tooth. But it's clear that when this pain is taking too long, um, I will lose also my vitality. I will feel um, yeah, a decrement of life because of this pain. And the last point is that Sheila presents that uh, these vital feelings as a category in his uh, broader uh, construct of four layers of affectivity. But I think that we should try to explore if this class of the vital feelings um, encompasses more subclasses of we can maybe establish some distinctions here. And this is what I'm going to do now um, in the last part of my talk. So don't worry, it's not going to take much longer. So, this is the idea. Oh, a moment, I see I have uh, something in the. Ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I think that we should try to establish some varieties of feelings of vitality. And here is a list of what I thought it's possible. This is quite speculative what is coming. Um, and this list is not exhaustive at all. So I think that there are other feelings of vitality, but this is um, something that I thought that it could be interesting to discuss with you. So the first one is this dynamic um, vital feelings, I call that so. 
and I will uh, reveal now why. This is a very elementary type of feelings of vitality, and this is just a very um, basic uh, increment or decrement of life is experience. So I put that in these examples, life fading away, life pulsing, vibrating, exploding, and so on. Here, um, we experience a change that's um, important. I, I put here a reference to Hermann Schmitz, who is a German philosopher who died last year, who, who investigated this basic dimension. And for him, there are two dimensions, one of contraction. For instance, what we experience in shock or fear, we experience a bodily contraction, like, which is not only bodily, but it's a um, feeling of vitality, I would say, or expansion uh, as we experience in relaxation or happiness. And um, yeah, this could be a um, kind of um, dynamic vital feeling that I have in mind. There is another author who has investigated this class of feelings and it's uh, Daniel Stern. And he calls that vitality affects or later in his uh, work, he called these feelings dynamic forms of vitality. Because of that, I call that dynamics feelings of vitality because I take the dynamic. And in his work, there are two thoughts uh, that are really crucial. And the first one is that the forms of vitality refer to a subjective domain of experience, which has phenomenal reality. That's something that we have already seen as it has phenomenal reality. It's a subjective experience. We cannot reduce that to anything organic or just purely physical. And the second idea, which I think that is really interesting in his approach is that this forms of vitality are gestals. There are walls that emerge when we have more basic elements involved. And he explains them in terms of holistic experience, emergent property, which arise from, and he says, movement, time, force, space, and directionality. So I think that we should take this idea of a gestalt and try, and try to apply that to more uh, complex feelings of vitality, which can also emerge as gestalts combining further elements. So with, I, with this idea in, my, in mind, I move to the next variety of these basic feelings of vitality, which involve this first category, the dynamic feelings, plus a kind of positionality. So for instance, the feeling of being alive. In this feeling, I have a kind of positionality, which is a form of self-affirmation in this specific case. So we, again, I put references to Fuchs, but I will not, uh, because he has investigated the feeling of being alive in a paper that he wrote 2012. So the next um, kind of variety are feelings of affective tonality. So here um, we have the, um, the, the dynamic, the basic feelings of vitality, but uh, here there is also an awareness of the affective tone of the experience of the livid body. And, um, and this is the dimension of being pleasant or unpleasant becomes more central. This is feelings of freshness, tiredness, vigor, discomfort. Then there are these feelings of ability which have, which have been investigated in current research and this is a complex gestalt or world which emerge involving the precedent levels plus an awareness of the continuity and discontinuity of our capabilities in time. So um, while the others are embedded in the now, the, um, the previous feelings, this, the now is embedded in a um, change and dynamic of time in the flow of time. So, um, it's necessary for these feelings that we have a sense of what we are able to do uh, now in relation to what we were able to do in the past or what we will be able to do in the future. The next, I call that comparative feelings of vitality because in them we compare ourselves with um, our past or future self or with other self. And here is, for instance, feeling superior or inferior not only in relation to others, but to ourselves. So um, I can feel now superior to myself uh, from two years ago because I, I survived this whole pandemic time or whatever. So, and then um, a more complex 
category is this kind of feelings of illness and health, um, which involve a sense of impairment of or empowerment, loss, or gain, confidence, or doubt. So these uh, feelings um, are more complex because they involve others, but there are probably more varieties of feelings of vitality. I put these ones here just um, so, because they are the ones who, uh, the ones that I had in mind <laughs> as more basic, but I'm sure they are much more. So I come now to the conclusion. conclusion so. So I think that uh, we should try to investigate more these feelings and uh, we should try to separate them from the broader categories in which they appear, because it's clear they appear in our emotional experiences, no? envy, envy related to feelings of discomfort, of feelings of, um, yeah, of diminution of our own life power of whatever. Um, but we should try to isolate them and we should also be able to understand them as having an intentional structure and as having a function. So they are not just there for being there. So they are anticipating or grasping this kind of changes in our life powers. So yes, and as I said at the beginning, so I think that uh, these uh, feelings play a role in more con uh, central concepts of bioethics uh, such as illness and health. Okay, so here are two points that I would like to discuss with you. The first one is that, <clears throat> what do you think about this conceptualization of this phenomenon in terms of sui generis feeling? Maybe you come and say, no, this happened to me once. Uh, Achim and Stefan um, still thinks that they are a kind of existential feeling. So <laughs> he could not agree with me. So I don't know what do you think, but I'm quite sure that uh, they are better conceptualized as a sui generis category. And uh, the other point that I would love to discuss with you is this elaboration of a taxonomy of feelings of vitality. How can this um, typology that I presented here to be uh, put in a system with more coherence and where other feelings of vitality can also appear uh, that uh, I do not have now, for instance, in mind. Yes, and here put the reference because I published that. Um, so part of uh, this, what I presented today is part of a um, so longer paper that I published in a volume that Susie um, edited. And I'm really happy that she invited me to think about this because I am still fascinated about the topic. And yeah, you probably know the book, but I put also a picture there. Um, yeah, so thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss uh, your comments, questions, whatever with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, as you know, I'm uh, a huge fan of uh, this work you are doing, because uh, I think that it can be applied uh, in so many areas of uh, psychological descriptions and it can help so many people because in this way we have uh, a more targeted way to help, I don't know, depressed people or uh, I was thinking about how to apply it in pregnancy, for example, in philosophy of pregnancy it could be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I open the floor to your questions. So if uh, any of you want to jump in and uh, ask a clarifying questions or um, uh, actual questions or so whatever you want, feel free. None of you. I need I, to break the ice a little. Uh, yeah. I I was thinking now about uh, pregnancy and about that, giving birth, no? Because these are extreme uh, situations. So when I was uh, preparing the paper at that time and now preparing the talk, I was thinking about the usual case you wake up or you now for instance i am extremely tired for the, not because of today but because of the last two years of my life now because now i mean probably it happens to you you have this kind of covid fatigue or whatever so you wake up and say again i am still in this kind of uh, situation and it's just yeah but uh, of course there are these extreme 
situations like pregnancy, like giving birth in the moment where um, yeah. it's also up and downs and also this kind of empathic um, um, situation. Paradoxical, right? Because I mean, you are at the peak of your vitality theoretically because you're producing life, you're mm -hmm. creating life. So theoretically it's the peak, but it's really not because <laughs> you're <laughs> feeling sick 24 seven, tired, you are risking your life because many things can happen uh, in that moment that are unpredictable. Uh, mm -hmm. How would your taxon, because I'm writing a paper now on the first mm -hmm. trimester in specific, uh, specifically, how would your taxonomy apply in a situation like that, uh, I would be really, really curious uh, because uh, when uh -huh. you wrote the paper, uh, I wasn't thinking in those terms. So uh, now I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, how? Yeah, the, yeah, this is extremely interesting because um, there are mixed feelings of vitality. Yeah. Um, and they are also mixed with other forms of affectivity, which are more cognitive. For instance, this. Um, feeling that you have, you are creating life that's more cognitive. This can be a kind of cognitive, you're right. I think so because, because, um, yeah, it, it depends, uh, what how the first uh, trimester looks like. I mean, there are people who do not realize that they are pregnant, and other people who realize that from day uh, zero and, and in a bad way because they feel uh, that they have to vomit for instance or whatever so uh, that's um, yeah and there are good days and bad days so i mean in this case um, you speak about a period of time of three months so this is mm -hmm. really long and then there are many mixed forms of affectivity moods emotions Mm -hmm. uh, existential feelings, <laughs> feelings of vitality of different sorts. So I think that really um, it's very interesting from the affective side. Uh -uh. And also this uh, time lapse from three months, whatever. So, yeah. Because, right, in these three months, uh, you cannot allow yourself to consider yourself pregnant. Uh, there's also not. that. Uh, so uh, there's a, a huge fluctuation of vitality. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to keep uh, your life going, uh, although your life uh, has uh, changed uh, completely. You're right. There are people who realize that, that there is uh, there are different scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, but but why you cannot consider yourself pregnant? Uh, well, uh, the first trimester is uh, the trimester in which uh, the, the 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 usual uh, two out of three women uh, miscarry. Yeah. Uh, you don't uh, usually you don't tell uh, that you're pregnant uh, to other mm -hmm. people because uh, there's this chance uh, at yeah. work uh, you are not considered pregnant. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, health insurance uh, will not consider you pregnant. Really? It's a sickness. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah, I know, sickness. I know. Yeah. But uh, you know, like, I think <laughs> it's interesting because for me, from I realized that uh, from from day I mean. I was a week pregnant, the test were and said, you are ah, not immediately. pregnant. <laughs> I thought always, I told my partner, or I am pregnant, or I have a deadly illness because I have to, <laughs> the, the feeling, something is, something is growing uh, in me, but uh, I hope I am pregnant. If I'm not pregnant, I probably have cancer, really. It was like, I, I have a kind of bodily alienation uh, <laughs> which is <laughs> yeah, i mean it was like yeah. and and then um i started to tell everybody <laughs> because yeah. so, even my yeah. boss told me i told him i'm pregnant and he said uh, uh well, how you're pregnant I said, but i am in the um, uh, sixth week and he said but wait it's uh, you cannot tell <laughs> that you're yeah, pregnant yeah. because you yeah. know but um, for me, yeah, because it's a, it's a feeling, but it's mixed with uh, your beliefs, your uh, expectations. For me, it was very clear, um, I am pregnant and uh, there is another being in me. Or, you know, it's just, I think it's a very complex um, phenomenon and you realize all, all what you believe and all what you expect is there impregnating what you feel. 
it's uh, it's yeah. very interesting yeah 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 and how does the germany treat the pregnancy a health insurance i mean uh, do they consider uh -huh. that uh, in switzerland for example it's uh, disease. disease if uh, you have oh, yeah if you happen to spend money on that during that trimester and it doesn't continue okay. for these three months it's disease uh, really it's tough, yeah. yeah yeah they yeah i have no idea yeah yeah, yeah. because i was feeling uh, really like having a alien inside but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way because it went well yeah but i, I continue it i i kept doing everything because i thought yeah i thought i cannot do anything you cannot uh, be uh, asked uh, to be at home for uh, three months or whatever but yeah yeah, mm -hmm. oh, it's interesting, and and I think that in any extreme situation, uh, these feelings are changing a lot. So, yeah. yeah. So, for instance, if you had an accident, no, where your life was almost, uh, and you realize you are losing your life, but at the same time, so there is this decrement of life. Exactly at the same time, there is this I want to live. So it's just like more. It's very interesting. So this. Um, yeah. And also in this point, I think that what you think, what you want, what you believe is able to somehow influence these kind of feelings. So, yeah. I wonder if depression happens, uh, of course, uh, when uh, this feeling of vitality cannot uh, kick in, mm -hmm. when you cannot ah. sense uh, uh, your life, uh, your uh, living body, your lived body. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember Fuchs uh, wrote about yeah. that earlier also. Yeah, Which... I don't know this thing about depression, but it's really interesting because um, like any other feelings, you can have them and you can oversee them. So like pain, it can happen also. Usually when you have, uh, when you are in pain, you experience that, but we know about people who are able to develop some techniques who are able to control this pain. And in fact, people who are in chronic uh, states of pain, they uh, look for psychological help just to deal with that, with these techniques where you can just give yourself a break about this constantly feeling. And it's very interesting what you say to conceptualize um, part of the depressive experience in these terms. Maybe your body is alive, but somehow you just block. Exactly. The that uh, uh, it would be great if psychologists uh, become familiar with your taxonomy because in this way they can target uh, that specific uh, layer of feeling yeah. and maybe help uh, people uh, with this kind of chronic pain depression uh, problems uh, to enhance uh, feelings of vitality you know it's yeah. like fine-tuning a little bit the machine uh, bringing something higher and maybe it helps uh, yes Yes, I, I think that we, we all know somehow these techniques. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you feel tired, but you have to, to finish something. I don't know you, but then I put some kind of music where I know uh, it's going to give me at least the impression that I am more uh, fit than uh, what I really are. And maybe I end up feeling really energetic, and uh -huh. at the beginning, I was very tired, but it's only music, but it's able to affect you at this level. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, yeah, yeah. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or people who just uh, decide to work in a specific environment because then this prepares them also at the bodily mm -hmm. level. I mean, we speak a lot in the debate on emotions about emotions as mental states, but this is so reductive because it's so um, it's only um, half uh, half of the story because uh, we are embodied beings and of course uh, yeah emotions and pandemic <laughs> we experienced that right I mean uh, we kept doing our job but uh, our body was participating less in this job yeah. and for some reason every one of us lost energy and we couldn't understand how to gather that energy again, what happened, yeah. why it's done. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's really interesting. So also this being closed at home uh, yeah. with the quarantines and I mean, it's, uh, it's terrible. I mean, uh, the, what affects you at this bodily level. So it's just, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I realized that my, the trick of my job is to be with the students. Uh, I mean, in the sense that you realize that uh, when you are in a class with uh, younger people uh, and uh, there's a good mood, uh, there's harmony and so on, yeah. uh, your vitality goes up. Uh, for some yeah. reason, you get recharged, you, even, uh, you didn't even know, and your day goes on. Yeah. And uh, yeah, with... Um, mm. With this crisis, uh, things changed. I noticed that uh, slowly through Zoom, I managed to gather something. Yeah. Uh, um, but maybe there's a, a meaning making experience that is uh, more powerful through Zoom because uh, you are on uh, meanings. I don't know what happened. Uh, slowly, I regained some kind of energy, but it took a bit. Yeah. Yes, this moment of change, no? it's just yeah. like. Uh, you have to change and then do you have to grasp information that you get in a way in the class uh, through other means and it's a process that you learn how to interpret all these different signs no? it's uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. different yeah. anyway i don't know if any of you wants to ask um, one question or add uh, a comment uh, uh, some of you left um, we that's the last chance if you want to jump in the conversation in any way I feel guilty that uh, I monopolized the conversation that's not uh, my goal generally for these uh, seminars Um, I have a, qu a question on on your you said how not to understand mm -hmm. um, the the feelings of vitality through emotion moods backgrounds and existential feelings mm -hmm. um, but um, as you guys were talking especially when you guys were talking about pregnancy the idea of regeneration popped into my head would that be considered a feeling of vitality because yeah, if, if it's uh, it regeneration is uh it can be mental i mean it can be also mental but uh, to feel regenerated it's a feeling of vitality for example you are tired you take a, a shower i don't know you but then you take a shower and then you feel regenerated fresh and that you have uh, new energy to do something this could be a case of uh, feeling of vitality but uh, were you thinking in this kind of examples or you had more complex phenomena in mind? Mm. Well, I, oh, well, from, from the regeneration, I, it, all, it made me kind of feel of like, okay, so the, gen, the generation of things. So like when you're like, for example, with, it, was, it all came from the pregnancy topic you guys were talking about. You're creating this life and you're direct. Mm -hmm. You're generating like the mental process. So in order to like you just come like manifest the, the things that are being presented, it's it's a pro like vitality would be presented as a uh, a form of uh, vitality. So I was just kind of like think that's what my line of thinking was uh, in the yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, in this case, I think that it's um, when things take a time, then probably there are more elements involved. So there is this felt dimension plus all these um, thoughts that come and enforce this, um, what you feel. So I think that if we want to be very, very analytical in analyzing this kind of experience of regeneration, probably we should identify many different aspects, the, the more cognitive, the more experienced, yeah, the more linked to what you think about being pregnant and then the feelings properly speaking. Okay, yeah, I, I was just pondering the idea. I just wanted to speak a little bit, that's it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you very much, by the way. Yeah, thank you for being there for the talk <laughs> and being interested in this issue. All right. So, Ingrid, it's uh, always a pleasure to see you and to hear you talking, presenting your research. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, my students were exposed uh, to your work. And um, yeah, uh, uh, thanks again for uh, joining us. Hopefully we'll yeah. collaborate soon on other projects. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to talk about this issue because it's always very, very uh, so fruitful when yeah. you have this uh, kind of discussion. So thanks. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Ciao.